Today we're standing in Toland Hall at the University of California Medical Center in San Francisco in a room full of frescoes. These frescoes were by Bernard Zackheim. He painted them in 1935 to 1938, showing the history of medicine in California. I'm Masha Zakheim, his daughter, and I have learned a great deal about California history through these murals. They had a great deal of controversy attached to them, even from the beginning when they were painted, some of the subjects that my father chose, and then later the egos of some of the lecturers here in the hall uh, who wanted to be the center of attention, not having students looking at murals, and therefore the murals were covered over from 1948 until 1962. They were covered with wallpaper, and on top of the wallpaper, some misguided soul applied oil-based paint, which then seeped through the paper and damaged the surfaces, as we found out when we uncovered the murals in 1962. But generally, the idea was the brainchild of Dr. Chauncey Leek, who was a professor in the pharmacology department. He said, our students come here, they spend four years in whatever school, medicine, nursing, pharmacy, dental school, whatever, and they leave the university and nothing draws them back. So what we need are some examples in art for them to look at while they're here and to come back to see. So my father, who was born in Poland in 1896, did not grow up in California, knew nothing about medicine, actually studied enough of the history here to pick out vignettes that he thought uh, would illustrate the history of medicine. What he told me was that he thought they were self-explanatory because in each panel he put in little anecdotes from California medical history with uh, small papers and, and little signs and boxes with names on them and so on to identify the figures. I'm afraid that 60 years later we don't know these figures at all and therefore we need somebody to explain them. There are two names that stand out. The name of this hall, Toland, for Dr. Hugh Toland, who was a pioneer doctor, and Cole, our Beverly Cole, for whom Cole Hall is named. The murals aren't in Cole Hall anymore. Uh, they're in um, Health Sciences West, room 300 and 301, but they were in the old medical building, which is torn down. This hall that we're standing in was built in 1917, designed by an architect named Louis P. Hobart. He also worked on our Grace Cathedral here in San Francisco. Uh, my father described it originally as a half drum, which has the sunburst ceiling, and in order to create panels, he simply extended the sunburst from the ceiling down the walls and created pilasters that gave him six panels in the back. And he then divided the front part into four panels. So he has a total of 10. And I would like to point out some of the highlights. He began in the back with the Native Americans of California and their various practices, greeting the sunrise, going into the Temescals and hearing the stories of the elders and then jumping into the cold water of the rivers and so forth. On the left-hand side, he fanned into the murals showing Northern California medicine. On the right-hand side, he shows Central and Southern California medicine. The panels in the front deal with the history of this institution, the University of California, the Hoover Institute, his imagined um, future in 1938, the beginning of World War II, and then the far right panel deals with early San Francisco medicine. And what we're going to do today is just look at some highlights from each of those panels. The panels, each one of them is divided into three sections. On the far right, we had the Native American greeting the sun. The middle is the um, scene of Sir Francis Drake and an autopsy. And then the left in that same panel is the arrival of um, Father Sarah. But the middle figure, Sir Francis Drake, is standing looking at the ship's autopsy surgeon who's cutting open Sir Francis Drake's brother, Joseph Drake, who died of scurvy aboard uh, the Golden Hind, which when it put anchor here in 1579, 
Drake wanted to have an autopsy to prove that the voyage itself was not um, damned by spiritual forces, that it was just a natural event. And the man that had been spreading superstition among the crew was the ship's chaplain who's there in chains. He's bound up and his name was Fletcher and this is Fletcher, the falsest knave that liveth. And that's all from historical annals. So he's um, being imprisoned aboard the ship uh, for spreading rumor among the crew and according to Sir Francis Drake, maybe fomenting a mutiny, <laughs> which of course didn't want to happen. Then Father Sarah is in the far left corner of that panel with um, friendly local inhabitants who are giving him medicinal herbs. At the top of that panel, you see some Spanish soldiers on horseback, and they are coming into California, bringing the two powerful institutions they brought with them, the armed services and set up the Presidio, and the establishment of the church in the form of the missions. In the panel of medicine in California, we see some of the first doctors to arrive here, mostly through the gold rush. One of them was Dr. Felix Wierzbicki, a native of Poland who came with the army here as an army surgeon. He is uh, shown there with a manuscript that he wrote called California as it is and may be. Being Polish and all, uh, Zakheim shows him with a tie with uh, the Polish imperial eagle, double-headed eagle, on it. Below him is a doctor who was considered a quack, Dr. E. P. Jones, for whom our Jones Street is named in San Francisco. He was very impressed with the wealth he could accrue from medicine, and we see him with his hands in gold dust here, uh, really literally fingering his wealth. The man in the brown suit with his back to us is Dr. John Townsend, who is here hammering up his shingle as the first physician to come to San Francisco, even before the gold rush in 1846. He died shortly thereafter in a duel, so he didn't have a very long practice here in San Francisco. He's remembered today by name of the street, Townsend Street, down in the southern part of San Francisco in the industrial area. Another doctor who had come as um, a research specialist is in the green jacket. His name was Victor Forgeau, a native of France. He was a medical doctor, but he was remembered at the time for his research work on diphtheria and that's what he's holding in his hand. It's a manuscript about the disease. Next to him is his wife and little boy. It's kind of an interesting anecdote. The artist preferred to work from sketches as models or engravings rather than photographs. He was waiting for a likeness of Forgeau's face to arrive, and the time came finally to paint in the face in the fresco the photograph had not come. So the artist just sketched in his imaginary idea of what Dr. Forgeau might have looked like. And when the engraving finally did come, it was almost identical to what Zakheim had imagined. In the panel on the far left, we see the arrival on black horseback of a very important physician into California during the gold rush time. His name was Dr. Hugh Toland, and he came from Virginia. In his hand, he's holding a diagram for a quartz mine, which was uh, streaked with gold, and that was how he was going to make his fortune, extracting the gold from the quartz. But when he arrived in San Francisco, he discovered there really weren't very many medical facilities available, and he set up a mail order business for the miners up in the Gold Rush country, where he did a brisk business. It seems when he died, there were about 5,000 of these prescriptions in his office where he had sent uh, potions to the different uh, miners. And the story was that he had two barrels, one called anti-syph for syphilis and anti-scroff for scrofula, and he would just dish out so many ounces of either one and mail it off to the miners. 
There was a quack doctor in the gold mines named Dove Hullins, and he had set up practice here. And then uh, an actual MD from England, Dr. Edward Willis, arrived on the scene, hung up his shingle, and uh, invaded the territory. They fought it out with the duel because uh, the quack doctor had torn up the actual doctor's diploma. And what we see here is the results of the duel. Willis won, and he had killed off the quack doctor. In the panel called Indian Childbirth, which was my father's favorite panel, we see four Indian shamans or shamans dancing in the background with medicinal herbs. In the foreground is the woman being delivered of child with her two midwives. And there are three aspects of obstetrics here that we can see. One, the midwives are applying fundal pressure to her abdomen. She's biting down on a stick, and she's pulling on a bar to give herself more strength. The next panel has us moving south. We're looking into mission territory. On the far left are Indians gathered about a cross, which has the initials I-N-R-I, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, which was very mocking, of course. Then we move to the central section, and there we have uh, a, a, a physician from Spain named uh, Dr. Pratt. He is working in a very makeshift infirmary there. And apparently, Dr. Pratt had to work in a church on the altar as his operating table. So you do see him there in the church. But what's interesting about the panel is that there's a temple there with an eye in the middle pediment in that triangle. That's the same eye that we see on the back of our dollar bill. It's a Masonic symbol, the eye of God or the eye of the supernatural. There are three candles, which are Masonic symbols. They stand for wisdom, strength, and beauty. And there are three pillars of the church. You can see two quite clearly, and the third one is sort of behind Dr. Pratt's arm. Then in the final part of that panel, on the far right, there was a man named James Ohio Patty, who had been a trapper. He had been put in jail. You can see the bars of the jail just behind him. He won his freedom by vaccinating a governor of California at the time. And so this was some kind of a barter system where he bartered uh, his vaccine for freedom. The people who are dressed in the shawls on the far right are in great suffering there, and they're kind of propping up the final pillar there for that edge of the column. The panel that we're looking at now shows the work of the University of California as a research institute. Above them is a ceiling with a skylight that really mirrors the room we're standing in. And the cluster in the center, who are all in white coats, were famous physicians here. Okay. Dr. Langley Porter, who was a pediatrician who was interested in childhood neurological problems for whom our Langley Porter Institute is named today. Dr. Herbert uh, Moffat is to his right, and he's the name with whom we associate uh, Moffat Hospital here in, uh, on the campus. So Dr. Nuttall is the figure who's working with a guinea pig at the bottom of the frame. The guinea pig stands for a research animal uh, who's used for the betterment of <laughs> studying of diseases and so forth. He's a pivotal point there for the composition of that whole panel because it's a fan-shaped position in a way, fans out to the ceiling, which has the um, reflection of the room we're in. On the far left is uh, Lucy Wanzer, who was the first woman medical student here at the university in 1876. She was already married, had three children, and decided to become a doctor, and received a great deal of scorn from her male colleagues. She's shown there in a chair that says androgen or estrogen on the back, and in her hands says she has a testis and an ovary trying to weigh them, which is superior, male or female. <laughs> My father was a, an affirmative action man from the beginning. On the far right of this panel is a Dr. Blake, who was also from England, who studied uh, periodic charts and native uh, elements here in California. And the man in the green coat is Dr. Uh, Jacques Lurb, who studied the parthenogenesis of sea urchin eggs. He became a prominent physiologist. The man on the far right in the blue suit with the bow is Dr. Saxton Pope, who was uh, 
the doctor of Ishii, uh, who taught, uh, who's uh, one of the remaining Native Americans of his tribe that came to live here at the uh, university and taught uh, Saxon Pope how to make an Indian bow. That's why he's holding it. The irony was the father had a heart attack in 1960 and it was his son, Saxon Pope Jr., who attended him down in Salinas. As a counterbalance to the academic and theoretical medicine that uh, prevailed here at the university campus, we have real life medicine out in the community. This composition is similar to the one of the library. We have the sort of fan shape of buildings in San Francisco uh, pivoted with this rat. The rat's an ambiguous figure because it can be a laboratory animal, but it's also here a symbol of disease because the rats carried fleas who spread bubonic plague. And we had an outbreak of plague in 1900 in San Francisco. At that time, its only victims were Asians and the governor of the state, Governor Haight, said that um, we don't need to worry about the plague in 1900. It's just uh, an exotic disease that won't affect the natives here. But we found out later that it broke out again after the earthquake and fire of 1906. It broke out in 1907, and they had to deal with it. But this particular vignette shows um, the earlier attack of plague. Balancing Lucy Wanzer on the far left that we just saw, the intellectual woman who went to medical school, we have the unfortunate victim of society, the prostitute at the lively flea, who's scratching against those very fleas that are spreading the bubonic plague. Above her are six figures from the sponge case. That was a medical argument between doctors Toland, who's at the far right, and Dr. Cole over the uh, medical treatment of a man who had been wounded by a bullet. You can see him lying there. His name was James King of William. It took him about five days to die of the bullet wound, but there was a big argument as to whether or not to place and remove a sponge in the wound. Finally, it was our first malpractice case in California in 1856. Finally, the um, judge acquitted both doctors and although Cole was 17 years the junior of Dr. Toland, Toland had to swallow his pride and ask Dr. Cole to come here to San Francisco and help set up the county hospital, which we have now on Potrero Avenue, quite a distance from Toland's medical school, which you can see in the back there with a the cupola on top that was actually in North Beach. It was a, a long journey from North Beach to Potrero in those days in the 1860s. The man who is looking at a map is uh, Adolf Sutro, who gave 26 acres of land to the university to set up a law school, a veterinarian school, a dental school, a pharmacy, and nursing and medical school. The law school never was built here. It went down to Hastings near City Hall. The agricultural or, or veterinarian school went to Davis, where we have an agricultural college. But the other four colleges were here, schools, uh, part of uh, University of California. The final figure to see is the man who really sponsored these frescoes, Dr. Chauncey Leake. Here he is plastering up the bricks in his house to uh, ward off the rats that could spread disease. He was a very interesting man. He was a PhD in pharmacology and was very interested in the history of medicine. It was he who really engaged uh, Bernard Zackheim to do the original Kohal murals and then these here. He started out with funding Zackheim with nickels and dimes, so to speak, from lectures and endowments and so forth. Eventually, the last year of this project in 1937, Zackheim decided to give prestige to the local WPA and turn the project over to them, and it uh, now is considered sponsored by the WPA. But we have to thank Dr. Leake, the uh, original patron here and donor uh, who envisioned these murals. The final panel that we're looking at here was my father's interpretation of the beginning of World War II. We had already had the Civil War in Spain. You can see La Pachinaria, a nurse uh, taking care of a patient there. In the... 
and the scientists are there doing their work. It's a question as to whether we're going to have war or peace. He's included the names of famous scientists like Newton, Lavoisier, Einstein, Rinken, and so forth, and whether their endeavors would lead ultimately to a lasting peace or whether they would be used for war. It was the eve of World War II, and we know what happened after that. It was in the most unfortunate application of science. But after World War II, we were able then to go back to uh, the furtherment of mankind. Mm -hmm.